Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, starting at verse 35. The same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he saith unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What man, at the end, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, he was the God-man. He was God manifest in the flesh. And uh, these disciples were just uh, getting a little glimpse, a little glimpse of who he was. And, um, you know, in uh, our life, too, we face many storms. If you're not in one right now, you may be in one tomorrow. There's storms that have uh, been with us in the past, and uh, sometimes they change us. They make us different people. But the storms will come. The storms will come in this life. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to, uh, with this short little message this morning, or this afternoon, I just want to have us consider that uh, with Jesus, we can face any storms that life may bring. And the question is, is Jesus in your boat? I have three questions from this, uh, this little story. Is Jesus in your boat? This is a real story. This is a real event. This happened in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, it happened to the disciples. And it is true. Is Jesus in your boat? <clears throat> the disciples here, uh, as uh, some of us may have experienced in the storms of life, the disciples here faced fear, abandonment, despair, and failure. They faced the fear of the storm. They felt abandonment because they said, Carest thou not, Lord, that we perish? And they were in despair and failure because the boat was getting full of water. And they probably forgot the bailing bucket. I don't know. They, they uh, fear, abandonment, despair, and failure. And the future, as a result, was uncertain. All these things happen to you when you face a serious storm. <clears throat> and that's going to happen uh, to any one of us if we face a serious storm. The lesson here is not to belittle the disciples, otherwise we are belittling ourselves, aren't we? Because we have all had similar situations. And so uh, the, as the disciples faced this storm and faced this fear, uh, they came face to face with... Uh, the question, who was in the boat with him? And so I want to look at three things this morning. First of all, again, it's not this morning. You have to edit that out of YouTube. <laughs> it's this afternoon. Is Jesus in the boat? Do we have faith in him and his ability? And we can, can we trust him for the outcome? <clears throat> can we trust him for the outcome it's important to have jesus in the boat jesus said in john 14 let not your heart be troubled you believe in god many people believe in god you believe in god believe also in me and it's important that people believe in the lord jesus christ when uh they uh that great storm in acts chapter 17 with the philippian jailer a uh, great earthquake, and uh, he survived that, and he 
um, asked Apostle Paul, what must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And in today's world, today's world, you have to add, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to the exclusion of all others. Many people have heard many things over the years and with the internet spewing out its uh, falsehoods and garbage, people are so confused. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a song back in the 70s or 80s, Dave would remember that. <laughs> uh, o Buddha by the Imperials. It won't be O Buddha sitting on the throne. It won't be Muhammad calling us home. It won't be Hare Krishna blowing that trumpet sound. It'll be the King, Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to the exclusion of all others. And the reason we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Why did he have to give his Son? because we were separated from God because of our sin. And as a result of the separation, that God's creation was separated from him and he wanted to redeem them, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever in. We were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life so the sin question was dealt with and when you accept jesus christ as your savior accept his work on calvary's cross he died for me that's a hard thing for people to do accept that jesus christ's death burial and resurrection was enough to pay for your sin it's a hard thing for people to do but it has to be done from the heart the heart man believeth unto righteousness with the mouth confession is made unto salvation <clears throat> so if jesus is in your boat guess what you've got all the power you need in the world even the wind and the sea obey him <clears throat> taking a cue from dave mcgee with his great hymn stories i have one too and uh charles tinley uh Born in 19, 19, 1851, his father was a slave, his mother was free, uh, and uh, his mother died shortly after he was born, and he was raised, his father sent him to live with his mother's sister so that he would remain free and self-taught to read. He wrote a great song, and uh, you may have heard it. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. And when the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. Yeah, great, great song. And uh, that was wrote in 1905. Don't know uh, why we don't sing it more, but it's, it's so great. And Charles Tinley faced storms in his life. And uh, he wrote that great song. He wrote a number of songs. He wrote about 40 hymns. So when Jesus in our boat, Jesus said, why are you so fearful? Where's your faith? Do you have faith, number two, in his ability? Do you have faith in his ability? You know, and I know, when the storms of life come, what exactly goes on inside our heart and the first thing is not peace the first thing is fear and so on and so forth but we must have faith in his ability we must trust that god is with us we must trust that he cares for us and the second chronicles 16 9 says for the eyes of the lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those, them whose heart is perfect toward him. 
So God is looking out, and God is watching. God, it's not nothing that happens that God doesn't know about, which has already been mentioned. In that great uh, Psalm, Psalm uh, 139, uh, it, it just rings in my ear some. He knows my down sitting, he knows my uprising, he knows my thoughts afar off, and there's not a word, O oh Lord, that is in my mouth that thou dost not know altogether. <laughs> he knows everything about me. And nevertheless, as the psalmist could say in Psalm 103, for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. But the Apostle Paul faced storms, as you know. Many storms are written about in the Bible. The, the One of the ones that's famous is Jonah. Some of the storms in life are self-inflicted. He was going the wrong way. God sent a storm in his life to turn him around. Some of the storms are self-inflicted. Some are as a result of... Uh, the events around us, we have no control over. And Paul the Apostle found himself in, in uh, numerous storms. <laughs> numerous storms, numerous situations. And he writes in 2 Corinthians 1, 9, But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. Isn't that a great verse? We have the sins of death in ourselves sometimes. That we should not trust ourselves, but in God that raises the dead. Sometimes God brings you to the brink so that you'll just trust him. In 2 Corinthians 7, he describes, uh, When we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God... That comforts those that are cast down. Comforted them with the coming of Titus. Sometimes, as has already been mentioned, you can bless your fellow believer. You can comfort your fellow believer. And that's something that as I grow older, not as old as Dave yet, but... <laughs> I... <laughs> I turned 62 on the 4th of August, so I'm just getting used to that. Just a baby. <laughs> just to come alongside a brother or sister that is in need, that's, that's a joy. That's a joy. That's something I wish I had done a lot more of when I was your age. Just to help somebody out. <clears throat> And so God that comforts those that are cast down. Do you have confidence in the ability that God has? Well, I'll tell you, there were three guys that did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> and they said this to Nebuchadnezzar, who was a king of gold. In the annals of history, Nebuchadnezzar will stand out as the head of gold. Supreme ruler, like no other ruler was a supreme ruler before him. Supreme ruler, old Nebuchadnezzar, and this is what they said to him. And these are children that were captured and taken and put in bondage and made to serve and uh, left their homes, maybe never ever saw their family again. And here they are in this foreign land, and in this situation, they said this, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image that thou hast set up. But if not, 
that's a tremendous statement to make to a king that's king of the earth. But if not, we will not serve thy gods. Don't serve the gods of this world, no matter what. And these young men, they believed that God had the ability to deliver them out of the hand of the king, but they were fully prepared to go into the fiery furnace because they were not going to bow to the gods of this world. Do we have faith in his ability? Number three, can we trust him for the outcome? Like those three men, they trusted him for the outcome. Can we trust God for the outcome? Can we trust that God has things in control? That, that he knows the end from the beginning. He has asked us to cast all our care upon him, Peter said. He cares for you. James says, draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. Those are God's promises. I want to tell you a story. Uh, a story about Hein Pham, Vietnamese uh, lad. It's called The Amazing Story of Hein Pham. In Vietnam in 1971, an interpreter, Hein Pham, was raised as a devout Buddhist. One day he was given a Bible by an American soldier. This is 1971. And he was interested and had questions, so he found a Christian church that could explain about Jesus Christ and his great love for him. Hein believed and accepted that Jesus died for him, and he became an energetic, devoted Christian. He worked closely as a translator with the American military forces, purely as a civilian. He knew English so well that he was able to be an immense help to them. By virtue of that same strength, he also worked with missionaries, but within four years, Vietnam fell to the communists and Hein was arrested. Accused of aiding and abetting the Americans, he was in and out of prison for several years. During one long jail term, the sole purpose of his jailers was to indoctrinate him against the West and especially against democratic ideals and the Christian faith. He was cut off from reading anything in English and restricted to communist propaganda in French or Vietnamese. Hein began to buckle under the onslaught. Maybe he thought I had been lied to. Maybe God does not exist. Finally, he made up his mind. He determined that when he awakened the next day, he would not pray anymore or ever think of his Christian faith again. The next morning, he was assigned to clean the latrines of the prison. As he cleaned out a tin can filled with toilet paper, his eye caught what he thought was English printed on one of the pieces of paper. He hurriedly washed it off and slipped it into his hip pocket, planning to read it at night. Under the mosquito net that night, he pulled out a flash, small flashlight and read the top corner, Romans chapter 8. <laughs> he began to read. True story this is. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hein wept. He knew that there was not a more relevant passage of conviction and strength for one on the verge of surrendering to the threat of evil. He cried out to God, asking for forgiveness, for this was of being the first day in years that he had determined not to pray. God's timing is impeccable. The next day, Hein asked the camp commander if he could clean the retreat again. 
He continued with this chore on a regular basis because he had discovered that some official in the camp was using a Bible as toilet paper each day. Hein picked up a portion of scripture, cleaned it off, and added it to his nightly devotional reading. In this way, he retrieved a significant portion of the Bible. The day came when Hein was released and began to make plans to escape from Vietnam. After several unsuccessful attempts, he began again to build a boat in secret. About 53 other people planned to escape with him. All was going according to plan until a short while before the date of their departure, when four Viet Cong knocked on Hein's door. They accosted him and said they had heard he was trying to escape. Is it true, they demanded. Hein immediately denied it and distracted them with a concocted story to explain his activities. Apparently convinced, they left. Hein was relieved, but disappointed with himself. He prayed that if the Viet Cong were to come again, he would tell them the truth. Only a few hours before they were to set sail, the four men stood at his door once more. We have our sources and we know you are trying to escape. Is it true? Hein resignedly gave the answer, yes, I am, with 53 others. Are you going to imprison me again? They leaned forward and whispered, no, we want to escape with you. <laughs> <laughs> Soon all 58 of them found themselves on the high seas, suddenly engulfed by a violent storm. As Hein concluded his story, he said, those four Viet Cong were all fishermen who were quite skilled at handling a boat, and if it were not for this, their sailing ability, we would not have made it. They arrived safely in Thailand, and years later, Hein arrived in the United States, where today he is an man. And he says this, forever grateful to God and thankful for America, praying that she would again open her heart as a nation to Christ, mm. and always be one nation under God. In, uh, in the second verse of uh, Charles Tinley's song, he says, in the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the hosts of hell assail and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I do the best I can and my friends misunderstand, thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When my life becomes a burden and I'm nearing chilly Jordan, O thou lily of the valley, stand by me. A great hymn. Another one of his hymns is Leave It There. That's another great hymn if you want to look that one up too. <coughs> The storms of life, they come. They come in many different ways and in many different shapes and sizes, as we would say. Uh, I heard this week there was a bad storm by Kirkland Lake, lots of hail. And uh, sometimes the storms come and it leaves a little damage. Sometimes it leaves big damage. We don't always know. <clears throat> and, and a lady by the name of Annie Flint, she wrote a number of great hymns as well. And again, she lost her uh, parents when she was at a young age. She was raised by another godly family, and so she was blessed that way. And then they, uh, they left her as well at a young age. They, they left her, and she ended up uh, suffering terribly with arthritis for uh, most of her life. And... Uh, I'll just tell you how she faced it by reading one of her one of her hymns that she wrote. <clears throat> he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction he addeth his mercy. To multiply trials is multiplied peace. When we have exhausted the, our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. Fear not, 
that thy need shall exceed his provision. Fear not that thy need shall exceed his provision. Our God ever yearns his resources to share. Lean hard on it, the arm everlasting availing. The Father both thee and thy load will upbear. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power, no boundary, no wonder me. For out of these infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. God bless you. And may your hearts be encouraged as you know that Christ is with you. And he'll be with you to the end.